Hello everybody, it's Kenneth from the Archives here with another in my series of videos looking at Dundee's railway history. Today I'm going to look at the third line to emerge from Dundee, that which headed west to Perth. At either end of the Dundee and Perth line once stood two iconic stations, but one still there, the former Perth General Station, which we can see in this photograph from the days of steam by Alec Cooper. Um, what I would draw your attention to that is the curved platforms, and that's where the Dundee and Perth line came into the station. Well, that's where it eventually came into the station, because as we'll see, connecting the Dundee and Perth line to the station was somewhat problematic. On the left is the former Dundee West station. This was actually the third station to be built on the site, and it was on the site of the original Dundee terminus of the Dundee and Perth. It's widely regarded as one of the great lost pieces of railway architecture in Scotland, possibly Scotland's finest lost station, although St Enoch's in Glasgow would also stake a claim to holding that title. Like many railways, the Dundee and Perth Railway owed its origin to the railway mania of the 1840s, a period where we saw rapid construction of railway lines and rapid linking of towns and cities. With connections already in existence to the north via the Newtal line and to the east via the Arbroath line, it made sense that Dundee would now look west to link with its near neighbour and sometimes rival Perth. An obvious route was to build along the Cars of Gowrie parallel to the Tay and then cross the Tay into the centre of Perth itself, and this is what eventually would happen. It was decided following a public meeting in 1845 held in Dundee that such a line would be desirable. An Act of Parliament was granted later that year, and the railway opened as far as Barn Hill on the Dundee side of the Tay in Perth in 1847. It would take a further two years for it to cross into Perth itself. It would eventually link up with the station that the Scottish Central Railway had in Perth. However, it came in at a completely different angle to the Scottish Central Railway's track, a right angle, and over the years this caused problems. Initially, trains had to reverse. Eventually, a platform was built at right angles involving reversing for trains that were going on. But as we saw in the photograph, the solution was eventually to build curved platforms. We can see on Charles Edwards' 1846 plan of Dundee how the railway came into Dundee. Unlike the Arbroath line, it made use of building on a causeway on the Tay to reach the city centre. This, of course, had the effect of changing the shoreline and, among other things, would lead to the creation of Magdalen Green. The railway was, from its outset, arguably more ambitious than either the New Tile Line and the Arbroath Line. It fairly quickly spread its tentacles. Quickly, it took over the lease of the New Tile Line, and it also tried to take over the lease of the Dundee and Arbroath, although that arrangement eventually broke down without ever coming into operation. A sign of its ambitions was it quickly saw itself as being part of a national network and in 1848 renamed itself the Dundee, Perth and Aberdeen Junction Railway, although it was never to reach Aberdeen in the form envisaged. As a result of its wider connections, it was unsurprising it was eventually connected in 1861 to the New Tau Line when the deviation was built through Lockheed Liff around by Invergowrie joining the Dundee and Perth Line at Nine Wells. There was a short-lived station which I didn't show on the earlier diagram at Nine Wells Junction. So the railway was now becoming part of a national network, and this became further the case when it was taken over by the Scottish Central in 1863, which in itself became part of the Caledonian Railway a couple of years later. Thus, it was part of one of Scotland's biggest railways. The Caledonian, of course, became part of the London, Midland and Scottish at the grouping of 1923, and the Perth line would continue in this operation until the creation of British Railways in 1948. One of the things the Scottish Central Railway was quickly concerned about was the state of the terminus at Dundee. And this plan on the left comes from the period between 1863 and 66 when the terminus was being rebuilt. It was seen as far too small, it was seen as a bit dilapidated and dangerous, and so it was greatly expanded. However, it was expanded again and completely rebuilt 30 years later at the end of the 1880s when we got the third West Station, the station you see on the right of the picture. 
in this wonderful sketch of the West or Caledonian station, as it was sometimes called. Now, why build an elaborate station like this? Well, partly the answer lies due to the location of the line. We can see from this map in the early 20th century that the area around the West Station was a massive labyrinth of rail lines, goods yards and stations. We had the Caledonian Railway Station, the West Station, and just to the south of it, its substantial goods shed, as well as various goods yards and engine sheds associated running along between the Esplanade and the Nethergate Perth Road area. But we also had another railway station that had come on the scene in the 1870s. That was what would become known as Dundee Tay Bridge and was the North British's station in Dundee. The North British was the Caledonian's primary rival and by the construction of the Tay Bridge, they were offering an alternative route to London. Thus, it was only logical that the Caledonian would want to outshine their rival by building a grander station. The North British station, although it's the one that survived, was never so grand, largely being constructed underground as a consequence of it being a through station. Here we have a view of Dundee West Station from later in its life. It's taken from the tower building just before it was opened in 1961. Um, it's not the usual view because usually you get the view of the station frontage, but here we actually see the train shed. But it also this view gives you an idea of the scope of the station, its good station beside it, and some of the yards round about it. Over time, however, the goods yards would disappear. The station itself closed in 1965, partly as a consequence of beaching cuts. It was redundant to have two stations effectively serving the same purpose, and West was a terminus, whereas, as I've said, Taybridge was a through station, therefore more useful, but also because of the development of Dundee associated with the construction of the road bridge. Gradually, as goods traffic to Dundee declined, the old goods yards would close down. And here we see in this 90s photograph from Dixon Park, a lot of them just as unbuilt on land. However, we already see new developments. The Science Centre, for example, would be built on this site, and we can see the Dundee Contemporary Arts Centre taking shape. We have quite a few records relating to the Dundee and Perth Railway in our collections. A lot of them are in the Dundee and Perth, Dundee and Perth and Aberdeen Railway Junction Company records, which are a subseries of the Shale and Small Solicitors records. But there's quite a few other collections where we have references, drawings, photographs. Have a look at our catalogue or ask us if you want to know more. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that short look at the Dundee and Perth Railway. Now we've got a link to the north, to the east, to the west. The next obvious place to go was south but that meant bridging the tea. But that's a story for another day. In the meantime, stay safe, take care, and we'll talk again soon.